So I want to welcome everyone to tonight's session uh, for Philosophy Matters. And tonight, the topic of discussion is the good life, uh, different perspectives. And to say a little bit about what the talk's going to be about tonight, we all want our lives to actualize some conception of the good life, where this notion will generally include fulfillment, happiness or well-being for ourselves, our family, friends and other people. In addition, for many, to live the good life also entails living with concern for both self and others, based on moral and practical or prudential considerations. Is the good life about experiencing lasting pleasure and minimising suffering, as hedonism suggests? In contrast, altruism proposes we should do the most good we can through our life choices, practical efforts and effective charity while humanism promotes acting on values and concern for outcomes which respect and support other people and better their opportunities in the world. So tonight, Akiva Quinn and Usha sister will explore perspectives on the good life as conceived by various philosophers, traditions and writers, including Plato, Aristotle, Epicurus, Hugh Mackay, Peter wow. Singer, Gretchen Rubin and Elaine de Botton. They will present the hedonist perspective on the pursuit of happiness as con constitutive of the good life and discuss how altruist and humanist approaches contrast with a focus on pleasure. Akiva will explore ideas about the good life as intrinsically and extrinsically related to a moral life. Usha will present some elements of a good life as laid out by Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics, and we'll also briefly cover the concept of eudaimonia or flourishing or prosperity as it ties in with the good life. So let me say a little bit about Akiva. Akiva Quinn, his first true love in the realm of ideas is philosophy, especially the sort of practical wisdom explored in applied ethics moral, political, and social theory, or praxis. He studied philosophy and sociology at Monash University and completed an MA there in 2010. Akiva enjoys philosophy and literature with a focus on meaning and morality and has co-presented workshops, workshops on living well and meaning in life. His other training is in computer science and he works in software development where logic and reason also play key roles and meaning can be crafted as well. Our second speaker, Usha, say a little bit about her. Usha's sister is a learning and development professional. She has a PhD in cognitive neuroscience and masters in English, as well as molecular biology. I'll say a little bit more about Usha um, when, we, when Usha comes to do her talk. So I'm going to hand over now to our first speaker, Akiva. Thank you, Akiva. Thank you, Les. Um, appreciate your ongoing role and uh, commitment, which I think is a, a marked contribution to the good life for all of us. So I really do appreciate that. And uh, thanks to all of our participants, to uh, my co-presenter, Usha for uh, coming along and being part of this discussion and to all of you for being part of the discussion. I'm going to post a question right now in the chat. I'll probably pay attention more to my presentation, but for those who like to chat, there's an initial uh, question. Uh, what, what constitutes the good life for you, which uh, will also be covered in the slides. Let me go straight to the slides. So um, Usher and myself are going to offer perspectives, not necessarily that our perspectives will be different, but we're going to uh, run through a number of different philosophical perspectives and indeed traditions in terms of what constitutes the good life, hence the first question which I just posted in the chat. So um, overall, one could conceive of the good life as principally about or significantly about pleasure and then some elements of purpose. Now, the, um, the perspective which I'll offer 
is that pleasure may indeed be and is part of the, uh, the picture, but that there would be a, a perspective as well or an elements of morality, uh, life purpose and attainment of virtue or striving for virtue to be part of a good life as well. But I will run through those different perspectives. Um, what constitutes the good life for you? We are going to try and uh, explore in the presentation and hopefully also in the discussion coming up afterwards. And uh, I suppose roughly synonyms for the good life will be a life well lived or a happy life um, or seem like uh, worthwhile aims and a necessary part of the human experience. Um, the other thought is what texts or thinkers or indeed traditions are going to uh, best inform the elements of the good life. Anyway, so the second question was essentially what texts or indeed thinkers you would think best uh, inform the elements of the good life. Um, so let's continue. I'm going to uh, suggest there's probably three main tranches in terms of uh, broad approaches to the good life. One is to focus on the notion of pleasure, uh, avoiding pain basically, and maximizing the experience of pleasure in one's life. And I will, I will suggest that it is rational for people to aim to maximize pleasure. So I think that's pretty much a given. The question is going to be, as we'll see, going back to Epicurus and uh, the views on hedonism, whether that is sufficient, whether that entirely constitutes the good life or whether there are other elements as well. Those who hold the moral life as equivalent to the good life would suggest that um, living well means to live a good life in a moral sense of the term, and altruism, concern for others, humanism, concern for human well-being would certainly be among those views. Um, the fulfilled life is probably the third, um, third stream in all of this, where a focus on character and happiness and indeed virtue would be what constitutes the good life. And Usha in particular will talk about virtue ethics and um, ideas from Aristotle. So I mostly won't delve into that. So if we look at the, um, the idea and, and I've sort of set it up as a contrast. So is the good life about uh, hedonism or is it about something broader in terms of the social good or the human condition or humanistic concerns. So let's start with Epicurus. Imagine you're invited into a garden. That's where Epicurus um, entertained and uh, um, engaged with uh, his followers. So um, he essentially was espousing that the good is synonymous with pleasure. So really it's about minimizing pain maximizing pleasure, not necessarily just in a sense of a sensual um, delight at that particular moment, but in the sense of a lasting or stable pleasure. So he understood well enough that satisfaction, tranquility, a life not concerned with, um, you know, matters of which would cause great anxiety. Um, for example, a famous uh, quotes, um, yeah, attributed to Epicurus is, death is nothing to us. So he wasn't concerned about the end of days. He wasn't concerned about the afterlife. He wasn't in concerned about eternal damnation, which some later traditions have, uh, you know, focused on. He was uh, mostly concerned with the here and now and living a measured but pleasurable existence. So the, the thought is whether equating the two, basically happiness and pleasure, and regarding that as the good life, will in some sense be self-limiting. And Henry Sedgwick in the 19th century, writing as one of the founders of the utilitarian um, uh, movement uh, within ethics, suggested that it was self-limiting. And certainly a lot of studies, uh, this is what's known as the hedonist paradox, many of you will be very familiar with, is that a life dedicated to pleasure is often um, thwarted, basically, uh, in the attainment of that pleasure other than fleetingly. 
So that's, I think, a very key principle that even from a pragmatic point of view, hedonism doesn't achieve in most cases based on lived experience and the human condition doesn't actually achieve its stated aim. In addition, um, it's worth considering whether that would be a life worth living, whether it would be a life of true value. So when we talk about the good life, we're talking about the happy life, but we can't immediately assume or simply conclude the conversation by saying, well, if happiness is good, then the entirety of good is, um, is captured by achieving happiness for oneself and even for a, a circle of friends, for example, in Epicurus's garden. So the contrast, which I'm starting to draw then, is between an intrinsic value, which is assigned to pleasure, so it's valuable in and of itself, is the notion of intrinsic value, and in contrast to that, humanism suggests that human fulfillment, liberty, social well-being, concern for others, a common sense of responsibility for one's peers, one's community, one's country and beyond is part of the good life. So it's really broadening from pleasure to purpose, as we termed it before, and to some sense of value beyond uh, simply the joy of the next Big Mac burger or the next series on Netflix or whatever one's particular sensual delights might be. So that's the contrast I'd like to explore further now. So I'm gonna just read this out in case any of you can't see it and then it's kind of there in our consciousness. The Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, let your belly be full. Make merry day and night. Of each day, make a feast of rejoicing. Day and night, dance and play. Let your garments be sparkling fresh. Your head be washed, bathe in water. Cherish the child that holds your hand. Let a spouse delight in your bosom. Let me explain the context and the um, sense in which... Uh, the, 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 uh, the way in which this text is, you know, being presented here. It sounds like a whole lot of sensual pleasure, and it sounds like a recommendation uh, to pursue all of these things. This particular epic is one of the early ethical texts, or it's presented as such. This, this extract might have you questioning uh, as to why it would in any way be an ethical text. This is actually... Um, from about the third millennium before the common era. So it's uh, something around 5,000 years old. It comes from uh, Sumer, which is modern day uh, Iraq. And it deals with um, the king of Sumer. This is actually counsel offered to him, to said king, to Gilgamesh, uh, from a, a barmaid at an inn where he's stopping over. So there's some parallels here with the life of rel relative luxury and indulgence that, um, uh, that the Buddha experienced before becoming the enlightened one where he lived in the palace and then he went out beyond that and experienced the suffering and came up with the you know, entire series of thoughts uh, which became Buddhism. So Gilgamesh actually, after being entreated or uh, told by the barmaid to act in this way. He actually went back to his kingdom and he focused perhaps a little bit like the king of Bhutan on, you know, the welfare of his citizens. So it's a cautionary tale. And in a way I'm presenting it as a transition between or a transition from um, a, a sort of hedonistic approach where he could have continued to traverse uh, the countryside and, made merry day and night and delighted um, with his spouse and all the rest of it, but he made a different choice. So we'll um, kind of move from that idea of perhaps there's more than, you know, um, hedonistic pleasure in terms of uh, striving for the good life to the notion of what the good is. So Plato 
talks about uh, the good basically as something unchanging. So he's a, a religious philosopher of the first order. He believes in spirits and he believes in the gods. So this particular quote from the Republic, the divine nature is as perfect as anything could be. Uh, is something constant. And he also looks at um, beauty and courage and truth being all connected to each other. So the idea here is whether, um, whether by understanding and directly connecting to the good, um, we can live, live, live the good life and basically understand beauty and, and the rest of it there. So I'll explain that a bit better in a moment. Um, Ulysses, this is actually a quote from the movie um, with starring Kirk Douglas, um, whether the Greeks were quite concerned with immortality and so whether there's something particular in the, the human condition and a human life that is worthwhile. So Ulysses says, there are greater gifts to be born and to die and in between to live like a man. So he actually rejects mortality because he wants the, the striving and the struggle and um, Homer is writing basically about all of his adventures and conquests and he finds that that journey is um, more fulfilling than simply to have the, the blissful never-ending existence of an immortal, of a god. And uh, related to that is this idea again of beauty and love. And love for someone or something is what takes us beyond ourselves and this unselfs us. And that's the basis Iris Murdoch, writing some decades ago, suggests for morality. So these ideas are really connection to value be that beauty, learning, love, connection to others, concern for beyond self, unselfing, uh, which put us in the moral domain and move us beyond um, uh, happiness or simply personal pleasure as the basis for the good life. So Hugh McKay has got an entire book on this uh, topic, but the nub of it, it's worth reading the other few hundred pages but he equates the moral life, he says, is the good life. So rather than uh, the good life is pleasure or the good is pleasure, we've moved potentially, if you accept the thrust of the argument, we move to a moral consideration being the basis of the good life. The reasons why that would be the case, we spoke in the outline about the intrinsic value of uh, morality um, and also an extrinsic value. So intrinsically, um, happiness and well-being are goods in and of themselves. And I've suggested there that they're social goods. So they're not simply goods which individuals experience in isolation, but they arise essentially in the context of uh, relationships, uh, love, as we said before, of other persons and other things. It can be beauty, appreciation of nature, um, appreciation of the world and things and, you know, food and all the rest of it. Um, but also that those social goods depend on people and place. Uh, the Blue Zones of Happiness, the book uh, mentioned there by Dan Budner, looks at how context, how people live in particular places has a huge impact on happiness. So again, it's not an atomic individualist pursuit. It really, um, the good of happiness, it is intrinsically valuable, uh, but it arises in concert with other people. So hence a, uh, a call towards um, some form of, of, of humanistic appreciation. Um, another concept will be that altruism, while it's good in itself, concern for others, it also uh, gives rise to a sense of satisfaction for the person who is living a moral life. So whereas with hedonism, we have probably fairly clearly established it's self-defeating by and large. Altruism is exactly the contrary, and there's a whole lot of 
scientific research on this. Uh, Matthew Ricard, there's a lot of TED Talks and so on. You can listen. He's um, uh, a Buddhist monk in, in recent decades, although that's not how he started out. Uh, but he's done a lot of scientific research and uh, it benefits a altruistic individual and clearly by definition as well as being intrinsically uh, kind of benefit beneficial for the individual. It's instrumentally uh, beneficial because it leads to um, the most good being done for others um, as well as the, the side effect of creating satisfaction for ourselves. Um, we can tie things into the US politic because often that's where some of the profound thoughts, you know, do come from with particular historical um, times, um, no, no less today than uh, in Martin Luther King Jr.'s time. Every man or every person, if you prefer, must decide whether he or she will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. So the contrast is drawn up. Um, in discussion, it would be interesting to see whether people think that's overly moralistic. But the idea is that there's a choice as to whether to be in the world with and for others or to be in the world purely for ourselves. And the selfishness seems to be self-defeating in terms of any pleasure we might derive from it and communally defeating in the sense of the good that could be done. So Peter Singer, for example, I haven't cited him in this particular context on the screen, but uh, he's got a book uh, last year or so, The Most Good You Can Do. And really it suggests that, uh, like um, Hugh McKay said just before, the moral life is the good life. It suggests that the most good that you can do is, you know, the aim in life. And it doesn't have to be in a self-defeating way that one has to neglect oneself in any measure, but that one can do the most good while looking after oneself as clearly a, a very significant uh, human being within the world, which you are, you know, um, at, at, your, at your local center with respect to. Um, so those were my uh, thoughts. I've got a few um, references there. I didn't specifically get to talk about uh, David Brooks, who's a New York Times uh, columnist, and he's on the US uh, PBS show for people who watch uh, some of that uh, television out of the US. And he wrote another book called uh, The Road to Character a handful of years ago, which looks at really virtue and character as the essence of living a good life. And his second book, which I think uh, is looking quite fascinating, it's on my reading list, is The Second Mountain, which suggests that uh, while we often start off by climbing the ladder and looking at the material achievements, which we can uh, string together in a career and so on, The Second Mountain is really the interpersonal one and the personal one where we're striving to develop ourselves as human beings and to uh, put together the elements of a moral life. So in conclusion for the first part, um, the moral and concern for others and the human family to me seems to be uh, a, a core part of the moral life along with concerns about our own pleasure and the well-being of ourselves and those in our immediate circle. So thank you. I think it's back to Les. Uh, thank you, Akiva, for a fantastic overview of the different approaches. Um, I'd now like to introduce Usha, who's our spe second speaker tonight. Just let me say a, a little bit about Usha. Uh, Usha's sister is a learning and development professional. She has a PhD in cognitive neuroscience and masters in English, as well as molecular biotechnology. Some of her key areas of interest are neurobiology of well-being and the behavioral and neurobiological underpinnings of deviant behavior. She is a voracious reader and also paints and dabbles with photography and filmmaking. Usha is contemplating on establishing a literary magazine and we wish her well with that. She's also crafting the details of her newly established consulting venture and we hope that goes well. 
as well. So thank you, Usha. Uh, we're all looking forward to hearing you speak. I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Les. Thanks, Akiva. That was a very graceful and um, very gratifying introduction from both of you. And thanks for inviting me to speak here. Um, this is actually just my second time here in the meetings myself. So it's it's been quite a quite an eventful time in, in a very, very good way. So I do thank Akiva mainly for getting me involved in all the early conversations and and less for guiding us through to this point. Um, so I'm just going to share my presentation. A further exposition on what Akiva was mentioning about what are the different qualities of a good life. I thought I'd focus on someone who I had studied back in university. I'd studied the Nicomachean ethics, large sections of it. And I thought it, he had something very interesting to say about the good life. So for Aristotle, the definition of a good life is to live a certain kind of life, which implies a rational principle. And it's, it's the nature of a good man, a good person to do whatever you do in a very noble way and performed with appropriate excellence. And if this is done, then happiness turns out to be an activity of the soul. So almost like happiness is a consequence of having done a multitude of things in a certain way. So Aristotle doesn't speak of happiness and uh, we'll get to what he meant by happiness next as a state of mind or a state of being. It's not a feeling that he's talking about, but an outcome of living life a certain way. He calls it eudaimonia, which basically means good spirit. Daemons or spirits were what were believed to have been driving, been the driving forces of um, our emotional lives, of our lives in the world. And good demons, good daemons, re basically refer to what we call a well-lived life, a flourishing a thoughtful and a noble life, and which is what has watered down and come to us as the term happiness. But I'm going to be using eudaimonia and happiness interchangeably here, but just would like to note that it's not a feeling that we're referring to here. So for Aristotle, eudaimonia is the highest aim. It is a virtue and the pursuit of that highest aim is the virtuous life. So he is happy who lives in accordance with complete virtue and is sufficiently equipped with external goods. So he's not negating the materialistic life, but he's also saying that it's not a sufficient con condition to call a life a good life if you are materialistically if you're only materialistically inclined or well-to-do. So apart from claiming that happiness or eudaimonia is a virtue, he's also saying that it's a conscious choice. It's not a happenstance. To live a life of this nature, it's something that we have to put conscious effort into, something we have to put thought into. A lot of deliberation has to go into it. So... He says the conscious choice can go via voluntary acts, that is, things that we deliberate about and think about and do with the explicit aim of experiencing certain outcomes, hopefully good and noble outcomes. Involuntary acts are more like the conditioned acts or reflexes, which not necessarily destructive, but at the same time are not deliberate in intent. A non-voluntary act for him basically are things that we do sometimes even against knowing that something is going to give a negative outcome, we still do it. So example could be imbibing in alcohol a little too much, knowing that next morning we are going to wake up with a hangover by and large, or eating too much, gluttony, or all those come under non-voluntary acts for Aristotle. And this 
um, is, is in some ways a summary of what Akiva was saying as well. And Aristotle makes clear distinctions about the different kinds of happiness in the Nicomachean ethics. The first kind or the levels of happiness being gratification and achievement, which is what we uh, saw in Akiva's talk about being simple pleasures, some level of hedonism involved over there where we are thinking about how to be happy, the pursuit or the relentless pursuit of a pleasure-based life, a pleasure-driven life, and including, and that includes money-making, though Aristotle, as we'll see later, has a lot to speak about wealth and money and putting that money to good use, where it goes from being a question of simple gratification to contribution, perhaps not attainment at a high level, but definitely in terms of the social good, in terms of the moral good, we'll get there. The second kind or the second level of happiness he talks about is contribution, which is more to do with the altruistic life, uh, the active way in which we engage ourselves in the worldly duties, in, in contributing to the society, in doing what is right by others and not just by ourselves. And for him, well, back in his times, it used to be more along the lines of honor, the honorable life, the righteous, the respectable life. And so that basically means that we are, the honorable people are discerning in their actions. They have a good sense of discrimination between, between right and wrong and then take the right value judgments and make the right decisions based on clear understanding of what is at stake. And in, in some ways, I'm, I didn't want to dwell on it, particularly on a different slide. So as an extension of contribution, particularly for Aristotle, the greatest good is actually politics. And for him, when he means politics, what he says is, while each of us is individually concerned about our eudaimonia or the immediate flourishing of our families, communities, politics, on the other hand, is considered about the, it's, it, it's about the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So the aim of politics is to ensure or pave the way for eudaimonia for everybody in the society. That was Aristotle's definition of politics. I don't think that's what we mean or understand politics as it is in the world today. Um, and the third level of happiness is attainment. And this is more along the contemplative traditions, uh, not necessarily spiritual, but to a level of being hermetic and uh, focusing on the wisdom traditions, perhaps becoming and being a teacher like Aristotle himself was. And in order to live any of the different levels of a good life, as we just saw earlier, he, he has, well, he has many parameters, but we'll, we can focus on uh, some of the key ones here. So courage, temperance, generosity, magnificence, magnanimity, gentleness, friendliness, truthfulness, and wittiness. In some ways, they are very Buddhist in, in their organization, in the sense that Buddhism speaks a lot about the middle ground, the eightfold path, not, not dwelling in the extremes of any situation, any emotional content. Aristotle is saying pretty much the same thing, of course, way before Buddha did. So one of them being courage. And that means when he says it's a mean in fear and confidence, it's being somewhere in between and knowing where to acknowledge each of those particular emotional qualities. He doesn't say that a courageous person doesn't feel fear at all. 
the courageous person sometimes feels that fear and even more terrified than others because he sees clearly he has more discernment than others so he picks out things that other people other people miss but he endures that fear and does what must be done in a rational way because and for aristotle that is beauty that kind of action is beautiful action and that's the beauty of a character he calls that a beautiful character and i'm i'm actually in love with that phrase beautiful character um, magnificence oh i think we yeah generosity generosity has to do with money primarily as to what people do with respect to money how they think about it and how they give that money so this is the mean or the middle path between wastefulness and stinginess so stinginess is when you take men money too seriously you're being miserly you're overly attached to it wastefulness is not necessarily the opposite where you you still like money you're still not underestimating the value of money but then you have no good sense or direction of how to use that money and that kind of wasteful action is dis it destroys the person who indulges in it gambling or any other form of addictive behavior a person of that nature would have multiples of vices in that person not just one i don't know why it doesn't okay so magnificence is similar to generosity except that he he has made the qualifying statement about a little bit of money and a lot of money so he's talking about the really wealthy people who can philanthropists spending about spending a lot of money and he says even that can be extreme in the sense that you make a lot of pompous display about the money we give to organizations or charity or whatever or we do it in a very tasteful tactless way where we put other people down and show others as being incompetent or miserly so while being magn magnificent with respect to money is wonderful we have to do it in a tasteful and tactful way now magnanimity is it's 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 a tricky thing and what he says a magnanimous person essentially has all the qualities that we talk about as one having a good life there's a fair bit of disclaimers here as to what a magnanimous person would be like they don't take small risks but they are not avoid or they're not averse to risk taking uh they're not susceptible to fashion and trends and they're not they you know they're happy to help people but um at the same time they're not overly focused on it so uh, they express their opinions out of esteem out of love out of respect but at the same time they can be reticent when they have to so basically a magnanimous person is someone who would live that thoughtful good life gentleness this is the other emotional mean concerning anger so it's it's not that anger in itself is wrong it's uh, this is similar to again what buddha says right anger to be angry about certain things is a virtuous act it's it's the mark of a very thoughtful person we have to be angered with certain criminal acts and intents and behaviors that's right anger but not quick temper not not to be led by that anger we may experience the feeling of anger for any number of right reasons but what we do about it so the the gentle person would not act out of impulsive decisions stemming from that anger they would act based on reason logic rational thinking even if anger is the determining motivating factor behind it friendliness these are some of the gentler virtues that aristotle focuses on the attitude towards people and here aristotle doesn't mean being friendly or in entertaining a lot of people or being you know overly nice but friendliness to uh, for aristotle is how we treat others if i'm concerned about the pain that i might cause another person then i'm friendly 
But even there, there is a mean point. So an obsequious person is constantly concerned about it. He's all, he or she is always tiptoeing on eggshells. And when another person acts offended or is offended, they immediately, or even if this person fears that he or she is offended another one, he's going to back down very, very easily. It, that's, it's, it's almost like what we call in science the fight or flight response. So they flee. They flee from any kind of immediate, suspicious, negative, threatening environments. Whereas the opposite, the, the fight one, is, is the quarrelsome person. You know, They object to everything. They want to make pointless arguments or they want to put in objections just for the sake of it. It gives them a high. It's a thrill. So that's another uh, extreme that Aristotle warns us against. Truthfulness. Truthfulness, on the one hand, yes, it's about being honest, individual honesty. But it's also about how to interact socially, how to be uh, almost Shakespeare and be uh, true to thine self. But at the same time, so knowing who we are, knowing what kind of people we are, knowing our limitations, knowing our strengths and weaknesses, and projecting that as is in a community, in a society, not misrepresenting ourselves, nor boasting, not being vain about it. That's truthfulness for Aristotle. And the last of these is wittiness. This is the more entertainment kind and uh, social engagement style uh, of a good life that Aristotle, I was very surprised the first time I discovered this in a philosophical treatise, it's about being charming. It's about being tactful and being playful and jovial. And he makes the distinction that a buffoon, you know, just can't resist making any joke uh, at the cost, sometimes at the cost of causing pain to another person. Most of the jokes are perhaps tactless and pointless. But on the other hand, an uncultivated person is someone who doesn't get a joke and his serious and somber and you know quite useless in a playful conversation and really doesn't add any humorous value to an informal social engagement. Um, and Aristotle warns us against both these extremes as well. Uh, he talks about more social aspects of the good life like justice and jurisprudence in other sections of the book, but that's really not for, we, we cannot cover that in this session. So I think that pretty much brings us to an end of what I had to say, uh, but just as further reading, some people who have spent a lot of time on Aristotle and uh, use, try to use them, use his principles in their daily life, some of their books, uh, The Happiness Project, and Happier at Home by Gretchen Rubin. Um, she, has, she has a yearly list of resolutions. She's dedicated a month of every year to uh, every, um, a, a certain set of resolutions for every month of the year, and she tracks them, and she wants to find out how that helps her live that happy, flourishing life. I may have the book here. As Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist, positive, uh, effective psychologist who studied happiness in more um, scientific terms. Darren McMahon's Pursuit of Happiness, he wrote, it's a historical survey of how happiness has been studied and thought about across the centuries. And School of Life has published many, many books on various aspects of um, the good life they have a school of life dictionary, a beautiful compendium with weird meanings, almost like Samuel Johnson's uh, fantastic uh, dictionary. Uh, there's small pleasures that helps us focus on some of the simpler things that we might miss or the big things that we could look at in a different way. Um, a job to love, that's another of uh, another book, A School of Life. Ellen de Botton has written a fair bit 
about eudaimonia. This is the pleasures and sorrows of work. Um, I recommend all these books and many more actually uh, to everyone who's interested in learning more. Thank you. Back to you, Les and Akiva. Thank you, uh, Usha, and, uh, and to Kiva as well for all of the great references. Um, and I think there, some of those or all of those are in your s slides. So hopefully we'll make the slide deck uh, available shortly. But I'm, you know, I'm continually impressed by how much the ancient Greeks still figure in our thinking today, not just Ar Aristotle, but of course, um, Plato and the Stoics and the Epicureans. And here we are talking about them 2,500 years later and the ones we have been talking about, they still figure in philosophy courses today. So it's a real testament to their longevity. But, but I think I really like what you've done, Akiva and Usha, today in bringing together these strands for what makes a good life. So it's not just this or that, but you brought together the um, the subjective feeling of satisfaction and well-being, so the subjective component. You brought in the external altruistic component about how we deal and help with our fellow creatures in society and animals too. I always like to add in the animals these days. To, um, and the third component, which I must admit I don't think a lot about, but you've really brought home that, Usha, um, about uh, working on our own virtue, building our characters. So having that comprehensive, all-rounded view of what it takes to, um, to have a good life. And it's not just about, you know, what's good for you. It's how you interact. Thank you.